Let's get started with what is data wrangling? And I feel like data wrangling in the data and analytics space, similar to data science, has become kind of a buzzword and um, it's used so often, but what does it really mean? And so I'm going to define data wrangling as the process of transforming data and preparing it for analysis. Now, that process is going to vary depending on um, the data that you're using and the project, the business questions that you're looking to answer. So not every data wrangling, not all the steps that you use for one project in terms of data wrangling are going to be applied to another project. But the it's really the term data wrangling um, encompasses a lot of activities. Um, and that includes some of the activities that we'll be doing today, such as joining multiple data sets, cleaning out liars, um, and enriching data. So today, um, I have five goals for you, but I do want to be clear that this is not going to be like a, a live coding follow along session. You will have the data sets available to you along with the slides. Um, that includes the exercises that we'll be reviewing today and their solutions. That's all available in my GitHub repository. Um, and then just in terms of housekeeping, I will be doing this in dBeaver. And dBeaver is a, oops. It is a, uh, a free multi-platform database tool, and I have used it at multiple organizations. I'm currently using it at Carter's. So I feel like, you know, uh, if you were, again, I was trying to kind of think of think of tools that were available to you, even if you weren't using it actively in your organization, and dbeaver is a great tool to have at your disposal. So of the goals that we're going to be reviewing today, um, I want to I want you guys to be able to query a data set, join data, union data, filter data, and create new columns. Uh, and that's essentially enriching data with new features. But why SQL? Like out of all of the tools, all of the programming languages that we have available, um, and there are some, some tools and programming languages that are really specific and conducive for data wrangling, why SQL? And I actually think that SQL is uh, one of the best assets that you can have at your disposal. Um, and it is one of the best investments of your time uh, for two, two main reasons. The first being that it's standard. So if you think about SQL, it's really used to interact with the relational databases. Well, how do organizations capture their data? Through relational databases, right? Um, the And SQL syntax is really standardized across databases like Oracle, uh, MySQL Server, uh, Redshift, which I'll, I'll be using today, right? So think of SQL as an overarching language uh, that has several dialects. And there was actually a question in the Q&A that I answered about like what variant of SQL will you be using? But the point of it being that it's, it's standard enough that you can learn it once and you are going to be equipped to query multiple databases, right? The other part that I really like is that it's scalable. So it can be used to process large data sets without you having to extract the data first. And then I also saw that some of you guys have experience with um, some BI tools, right? So if you're using Tableau, you can establish uh, connections to these relational databases, query them and wrangle your data with SQL, which is a lot of what we do at Carter's, um, and then schedule your queries to run on a regular basis, right? To update the data and reprocess that data without you having to make updates to your code. So it's really scalable in that uh, aspect. If you think about it, if you're using Excel now, I mean, think about how not scalable that is, right? So um, I, this is one of the great reasons why SQL is really a great asset to you. And what I'm going to try to do is I do recognize that a lot of you guys have experience, maybe not in SQL, but you have a relevant experience in Excel and other tools um, and in, in some of these BI tools as well, right? So I'm going to try to kind of leverage some of that when we think about these high level concepts of data wrangling with SQL. For these exercises, we're going to be using uh, four different data sets. Um, and if you use Tableau, these might be familiar to you. I actually derived these tables from Tableau's Superstore data set. So if you've used uh, Superstore data, then you're likely very familiar with this, right? Um, we have orders, archived orders, products, and customers. 
And uh, below each table name, I've listed out the columns in them and then their data types, right? Um, and, and this is always important for you to know. The other thing that I do want to note about some of these exercises is that they're going to be very aggregate exercises of these tables. So we're going to really pull like high level information from them. And in practice, you're likely going to want to pull more granular data sets for data analysis and data modeling. But the point of the exercises is that you can extend them to get more granular um, and you can update them, right? And the, the other great thing that I, I'm gonna try to kind of embed throughout the webinar is that we're gonna run through five different exercises, but you can at the end and as you're practicing, right? You can kind of combine those exercises to build a more comprehensive data set. Um, and I think that that'll make a little bit more sense as we as we go along. All right. So let's get started with our first goal of how to query a data set. Um, and I have to tell you guys a little story real quick. So when I started at an organization, it was a Fortune 500 company, and I had you know several years of experience. I was getting really frustrated though because. Uh, I was sitting in an IT function uh, alongside, you know, software engineers, and I had to start writing SQL, and I had never written SQL before. I uh, I had written in different statistical packages. I had used R before. I was really proficient in Stata, which is an, a statistic pack, a statistical programming package for economics, and I didn't know how to write SQL. What was frustrating. And I think the reason that I was kind of struggling through it was I was so focused on the syntax and kind of like how to write in that language and less focused on the um, the methods that I had already been practicing throughout my career, right? How to grab data, how to join different data sets. And so that's what I'm really going to try to focus throughout this webinar, again, is less on the exact syntax and less on the, you know, the, the specific dialect of SQL and more on the concepts of data wrangling and how to leverage SQL to do it. So uh, when I was working at this Fortune 500 company, my colleague would take a piece of paper and he would do a trifold. And at the top of each section, he would write select from where. And he would then have me list out how uh, the fields that I wanted to include in my results set, my data frame, which tables I was gonna have to query to get those columns. And if I needed to uh, kind of apply any special conditions to filter that data, and I would use that where section of the paper. And that really helped me kind of think about how um, visually, how to structure my queries to kind of build a skeleton framework, right? And so that's what we're gonna do today. Our first exercise is gonna be, what was our historical annual profit? I'm gonna uh, switch over. So you guys are gonna have to pair with me here. All right, so the first thing that I do whenever I start working, and I'm going to not save this one, all right, whenever I start working with a table that I've never seen before or a table that I've seen a million times, is I like to first take a peek at that um, table. So I'm going to select star, and star means everything. I'm just going to pull everything from that table, and I'm going to pull up my orders table, right? Uh, I know from the column list that that's where I have my profits. And I'm going to limit five. So if you have used, um, I'm going to run this. If you've, if you've used Python before, this is where you would print head five of your data frame. So again, very similar concepts. So right here, what I'm doing is I'm just pulling a sample of five rows from my orders table to get a sense of the data. All right. So I see here my column names. I see the data types, and I can kind of get a sense of granularity from this table, right? I see that it's at the order level, and then I also have a couple of IDs, like customer ID and product ID, which I can use to enrich with uh, additional customer and product information. All right, so our first exercise asked us to identify historical annual profit. Well, I can start by just kind of updating my query, and I'm going to select you know, I know I need year and I'm going to derive year from my order date. So I'm going to just select order date from here and then I need profit. All right. So let me also show you really quick what 
just a select star looks like. All right, so this, if I were to export this data, it would be all of the data inside of this table because there's no limit here. If I go, again, I'm only interested in date because that's what I'm going to use for a year and profit because I want to find the most of because I want to find profit by year from orders. Let's see what this looks like too. It's a lot of rows. And I really wasn't expecting this because I was kind of expecting it to aggregate on the day, right? I would have one row per day. What's happening here is that we're really using the same data that we had in this query, but we're not aggregating it to any level higher, right? We're just excluding columns because we didn't include them in the select. So because I'm wanting to uh, extract year from my order date and aggregate my profits at that level, I'm going to have to make some updates here. So if you have used Excel, you are likely familiar with the date part. So I'm going to take the year from my order date and I'm going to take profit. So let's see what that looks like. Looks the same. And I'm not paying attention to the chat, but if you are active in the chat, I want you to kind of give me a suggestion of what you would expect uh, for me to do here. And if you've used Tableau or Power BI, you likely know that, and you've you know updated, uh, created any any uh, calculated fields. You probably know that I need to aggregate my profit um, and sum it here. So I'm going to sum profit. You can do. Uh, different types of aggregation. So you don't have to do some depending on your kind of use case of the business question that you're looking to answer. Here, I want to find a total profit. So I'm going to do that. I need to do one more thing. I need to group by my year. And so let me show you what that looks like. All right. So now I have one row for each year and the total profit. There are a couple of things that are happening here that I want to kind of clue you in on because I think it's going to uh, become important as we work through the rest of our exercises. Um, let's pay attention to our, our column names. They're going to be kind of generic based on the functions that I've uh, used. So here we see some, here we see uh, Postgres date, right, date part. I'm going to alias this. And to alias a uh, field means to kind of think about giving it a nickname. I mean, I think um, that's pretty common, right, to, to rename columns. So that's what I'm going to do with an alias. I'm just going to add that name that I want to call that column after, the, after I select it. So here for my date part, I'm going to name it YR for year. And I'm going to do that instead of spelling out year so that it doesn't confuse it with the function. And then for profit, I'm going to call it like annual profit. All right, so now here you see that I'm aliasing the column names. Now, this is something that I'm going to do. I'm going to explain it. I don't want you guys to focus too much about it because it is about syntax. But when I was talking about the dialect, because I'm using um, Redshift, I can extract year from order date, and that's actually the way that I prefer to do it. So I'm going to do that. I don't want you to pay attention to that too much. I just want I'm, I wanted to like, tell you that that's what I'm going to do because I'm in uh, I'm in Redshift, and this is my preferred way of doing it. And then another thing that you're going to see me do is when I group by. So if I had multiple um, dimensions in my select clause, I would have to group by each of those. You're going to see me alternate between explicitly naming the columns and then referring to them in, uh, by their uh, position. I prefer position because I don't want to type out all of the, the names. So I'm going to, you saw that I switched it out to group by one. And that means just group by the first column in the data frame. All right. Okay, and then if I go back to my slides, there was another question of how much product was shipped by each ship mode. So now that we've kind of walked through querying the orders table to find, to aggregate to an annual level and to find profit, I think uh, we're pretty equipped here to do the same thing with ship mode. So I'm gonna do the same thing here. I'm gonna select 
ship mode, and I'm going to remember to send quantity um, from orders, and I'm going to group by one. Now I need to go back and do this. to alias it. All right. So any questions here before we move on to our second concept of joining data? Yes. <laughs> so we have a few questions. Um, we'll start with Christy. Uh, so what program do you use? Are there programs you recommend for SQL? Um, in terms of if let me take a step back and kind of talk about the tool stack that we have at Carter's, which I, is for me kind of phenomenal. We use dBeaver to access our databases to query them. So I, I that's the tool that I use. I stick with them that I recommend, um, and I've used it across organizations. So to me, it's pretty standard. Um, and then in terms of BI, you know, a BI tool, we use Tableau. I'm not as familiar with um, Power BI, but the reason that I bring that up is because we also leverage Tableau to write custom SQL queries against our databases. But if I, all I was doing was just accessing um, the relational databases, I do it directly through DB, dBeaver. Okay. One other, uh, I guess, um, non-technical question is, can you zoom in on your code? Um, it's just coming a little, a little small. There we go. Um, if everyone in the chat, if you are having this issue with seeing, uh, can you can you let me know if that's big enough? And then if not, I'm sure we can we can make it bigger. But um, it looks good from my end. So, um, anyways, back to technical questions. Um, uh, can you use alias for group by? And this is followed up with, or can you only use by position? So you cannot, you can't use aliases. If I, for instance, here I'm aliasing the year as YR, I can't group by YR because it's not going to know. Oh, it will. So I take, I take that back. Sometimes it'll let you do it. Sometimes it won't. Um, I wonder if this is because it had already pulled it. Um, so give it a try. I'm telling you, if you see me code. You're always going to see me use my uh, use the the line position because I don't want to type it out. Especially again, our our exercises are going to be very aggregate, where we're going to just choose a few columns from our data frame. But in practice, you're going to be building out data frames with a lot of columns, and your queries are likely going to look longer than the ones that I'm going to be writing. So just imagine having to like you know type out. I don't know, 20 more fields versus typing out one through 20. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay, and then one that I think is somewhat similar and um, I'm hoping we can infer the question, but it just says group by YR, which I think stands for a year, mm -hmm. um, but it just has a question. So <laughs> a question mark at the end of it. So I'm hoping we can infer um, something out of that. <laughs> Not sure. uh, yeah, I'm not sure. That was, that was probably in terms of like grouping by the alias. So, mm -hmm. um, but but if I may, so another thing that I think might not be as obvious in this exercise because we're only choosing one um, one dimension here. Let's say that we're looking at, you know, the year. We do want to see um, the customer ID. So I'm going to add that in here. Now I need a group by customer ID as well, right? Because that's an additional level of detail within my data frame. And so I need to add that to the group by. And this is a very important concept in terms of like making sure that your data is, your data frame is aggregating to the right level as uh, th the concept of like, grouping on all of the dimensions that you're using in the data frame and, and uh, accurately aggregating your metrics. Okay, perfect. And we have um, a few more questions that um, I think should be pretty quick to get through. So we're gonna do those really quickly as well. Another group by question, can you group by alias? Well, I in this example, I thought that we couldn't, but we could. 
Okay, so, <laughs> so, so if you yeah. remember yeah, where I had it, where I was like, oh, it's not going to recognize what year is because I had aliased it and then it did. So you can, Great. but I know that in some dialects, it will not allow it. Okay. And um, uh, this is, uh, I'm just going to read it out. It says, oh, so we don't need to use the as prefix. You can. Okay, so this is also a good question. Um, you you can in some dialects, and I'm not, you know, an expert in all of the SQL dialects, but sometimes what you're going to have to do or what you will see if you're reviewing somebody's query is they will specify the column that they're selecting, and then they alias with the as keyword. And you can do the same thing for order. So I could alias my orders table as O and refer to it to the table with the, the, um, the prefix O throughout the query, or I could alias it like this with the as command. And so this will return the same results. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, last question before we move on. Uh, what, ex what extract function did did you compare to date part? What extract function? Okay, so in uh, what in the PostgreSQL, I used extract and then year. So it's the same uh, year. You just have to enclose it in in um, parts. Okay, perfect. That's it for now. So I'll let, or I guess that's not it for now. But we're gonna save the the rest of those questions uh, for the end. Uh, so let's continue, make sure we have enough time to, uh, to, to get through the presentation and, um, and we'll stop for questions again uh, in the next section. All right, thank you. Yeah, so the next concept that I really wanna kind of focus on, and this is, you're gonna run into this very quickly at any organization across industries is joining data, right? And that's the idea of combining data from multiple tables and really combining that table with the data by adding columns from different tables, right? You're gonna combine the data on a common key or a shared field across the tables. And something that you're gonna have to really uh, be aware of in joins is duplicating records. And there are a couple of questions that I ask myself if I'm seeing kind of duplicate records is, um, am I using the primary key, all of the primary keys to join tables? Um, and are my uh, tables aggregated to the same level? If not, am I clear on the type of aggregation, right? So sometimes business users or you as a technical user might have some misconceptions on the, the level of detail in the tables. So this was one of those slides where I was warning our SQL experts, don't come at me. <laughs> because I know that this is not an inclusive list of the types of joins, right? There are many joins, many more joins than I have included on here that are available to you. To me, these are the three most common. I have um, but experienced them um, throughout my uh, experience, but then also these are the three most common that I leverage, right? the left join being number one. Um, in terms of left join, what that's gonna do is it's gonna return all of your records from table one, which is also considered your left table. And then it's gonna return matching records from table two. And this is the one that we're gonna use in our exercises, right? Uh, there's also this concept of an inner join and what the inner join is, uh, will do, it'll return records that have matching values in both tables, right? So it's only going to, uh, return like the common rows and an outer join is going to do the opposite. It's just going to return everything. So it's going to return all your records from both tables, those both with or without a match. Um, there's something that I wanted to mention here, but I think we're going to get to it. Um, okay, so with the, your left join, your left join and your right join are very similar. Um, just think about them swapping uh, places in terms of your right join is going to keep everything from your right table. And that's why I was saying uh, that for me, these are the three most important because they will cover most of your use cases. Like if you can do everything with the left join, why would you even bother with the right join? Um, 
All right, so for our exercise, uh, the first one being, what was the most profitable region overall? So let me hop back over to the beaver. All right, so I'm gonna have to do a refresher on um, the tables that I have. I think I saw from the, the list of tables that I provided that I had region in my customers table. So let's take a look. All right, so I have region here. I have customer ID, and that's what I'm going to use to join on. Um, and then I also have, well, that's all I need. All right, so let me pull some data from my orders table because I'm interested in profit. Um, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start by selecting everything from my orders table. And then what I want to do, let me alias this. So I'm going to say, take everything from orders, but only take region from customers. I'm gonna left join customers to my orders table. So remember, I'm gonna use my customer ID. All right, so now I have everything from that orders table and then I have regions. Now I can really see kind of the region for that order. Now we can kind of start aggregating to a level up. All right, because I was, uh, I'm only looking for the most profitable region. I'm gonna keep region. I'm gonna take the rest of orders out because I don't need that much detail. But what I do need is the sum of the profit. And we already practiced aggregating uh, to a higher level. So I know that I need to wrap profit in a sum and I need to group by. And I'm gonna um, start splitting out my lines. A, I think it's easier to read, but B, it's more common. Um, Okay, so let me run this and let's take a look. All right, so here I see the region and then the sum of profit. We can alias sum, which we should have done. We'll call this regional profit here. Now I could have done this with the right join as well. Uh, and actually, because I'm only using region from this table, it really wouldn't matter because I'm aggregating anyway. Uh, but we could have done uh, so. We could have done from customers left join region that would have yielded the same results, or we could have done select from customers um, and then right join orders. That would have been the same thing as this, just because we flipped the order of our tables. So we were referring to orders as the left table or the right table. Um, let me pause here. Do you guys have any questions? Yes. <laughs> um, uh, all right, so first question, um, uh, what is the name of the platform that you're using for a uh, SQL query on data? All right, so I'm using AWS Redshift. So I'm, I'm accessing Redshift um, and that's where my data is uploaded and stored. Okay, perfect. That's my database. Um, and then- is that what, Does that answer the question? I'm not sure if- I think so, but we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so, so going back to what you were just doing, um, does it sum even if the profit for that region is null? Um, like there's no issues with that? Or um, do you need to explicitly handle it like set to zero if null. No. Um, you don't need to explicitly handle it because when it's doing the aggregation, it's just gonna aggregate the values that it does have, right? Because it's at a higher level. There are some times where you'll have to coalesce the nulls uh, or you know uh, adjust for them, but because this is very uh, aggregate, we don't need to. That is all of the questions I'm seeing that are relevant to this section. So I'd say let's move on. 
And um, again, we'll answer any questions that we haven't answered, we will answer at the end. Okay, cool. So there was another, uh, in the join exercise, there was another uh, option to, um, or another question, which is what is the best selling category? And I want to show you guys this because it's uh, pretty relevant. So again, I'm going to go back to my favorite thing is just to take a peek at the data. All right, so if you think about this, when you're analyzing data, your product ID and your customer ID, um, they're interesting when you're doing the data wrangling, but in terms of analyzing the data and really uh, distilling it, you're not going to learn a lot from product ID, right? You need all of the uh, other dimensions and just descriptions from that product to give your data meaning. And so uh, this is, again, a very aggregate exercise where we're pulling just one level of our product and aggregating on sales. But in reality, in practice, what you would do is you would select, you know, all of your interests, uh, all of the fields that you're interested in from your orders and start enriching that data with different columns from your products table and your customers table. So here we were interested in the best selling category. It's very similar to the exercise that we just did. So I'm going to select category from this table that I'm going to call this um I'm going to call this products table p for, for ease all right alias is there and now I'm going to sum sales and sales is going to come from my orders table um I don't, I don't want to go on a product, uh, on a, down a rabbit hole, but when we get to the where section, I might show you guys another kind of quick way that I, I get away with not using the left join and the on explicitly. I, I take some shortcuts. Um, all right, so product ID, let's see what the sealed, um, I don't know, must I, so let's group by one. All right. So same concept. We're joining on um, on a common key, which were our IDs that we had across two different tables, pulling the columns that we're interested in, and then uh, aggregating our measures. So again, we could do something like this. which is likely a more applicable oh, group by one, two, three. <laughs> and see how much time I saved? I don't have to explicitly call out each of my columns. Um, but this is more realistic query, right? For you to do analysis and, um, and data modeling where you're kind of looking at row level data, but enriching it with different columns. All right, let me move on to our next concept, which is unioning data. And so unioning data is, is kind of the same concept of joining where we're looking to combine data from different uh, tables or different result sets, right? Here, instead of adding columns from the other table, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be stacking uh, result sets or data sets, data frames on top of each other, right? Um, and the results sets should have the same number of columns and they should have uh, similar data types. The columns should be in the same order as well. So that's very important. Um, and there are really just two types of unions, union and union all. Uh, when you uh, put a union clause in your query, it's only gonna keep unique records from your two result sets. If you did union all, union all it's gonna keep everything. All right, so we're going to kind of look back to our first exercise, which is what was historical annual profit, and we're going to um, enrich that data with some of our archived orders, right? So we have, and this, again, is a really relevant example in 
in, uh, in practice where relational databases have their limits. And so a lot of the time DBAs or database administrators are going to archive tables based on, uh, you know, some type of time frame. So uh, most of the time, they're only going to retain like three years of history. And then anything older than three years, they're going to archive and they're going to kind of like put it in a separate location. That doesn't mean that it's not accessible to you, but it just means that it's in, in the archives and that um, it's not readily available like all of your other tables, right? All right. So let me go back to DBeaver. Let me start from scratch. All right, so I'm going to query. Anyway, you guys are so sick of me doing this, but I'm telling you it's so helpful. All right, so here I'm going to just kind of take a peek at the columns that I have in my table at the order of the columns. Um, I'm going to kind of take a, get a sense of the data types, and then I'm going to do the same thing for archived orders because I remember I have this constraint that they have to be in the same order, have the same data types. All right. Um, now, now that I've kind of done some of that sanity checking and I feel confident in that, I'm going to look to union those two tables again, stack one on top of each other, uh, one on top of the other. So I'm going to take all the data that I have from orders and then I'm going to stack it on top of my archive orders to get a full sense of history. And because I am um, aggregating this to a really high level, again, it's at the annual level. And we've already worked on this query. If you guys remember, it was select um, year from order date. We did some sales, or it was profit, sorry. So some profit from orders by one. Okay, so this is the query that we were originally working with. So we have two options here um, or two methods that we can employ. The first method is we can do the same thing here, and, but to the archived orders and, and then kind of stack those results. <laughs> Sorry, let me see what's going on here. Um, execution failed. Did I do something wrong? That's okay. I have, I have my backup. And in my backup, I reverted to date part. The error message, by the way, was not related to extract year from or date part year. I, likely I missed something. If you're new to SQL, by the way, and you are um, trying to debug your query, look for a missing comma. Look for an extra comma. There, uh, a lot of those things would kind of trip me up, again, kind of focusing on the syntax of SQL as I was learning. Um, so kind of focusing on that. So as this is running, and I shouldn't take that long, but let's see what happens. As this is running, again, let's focus on the methodology here. Um, what I've done is I've aggregated my orders to look at the year and the uh, total sales. And then I really should have sw swapped this out for profit. But um, And then I did the same thing for archived orders and then taking those two result sets and stack them on top of each other. Something else that I could have done, let me start a new one. Something else that I could have done is I could have just taken the at all of the row level data, right? So like stacked the two tables on top of each other and then aggregated from there. So actually, let me do that. I think that this is debugging. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna let it, like let it roll. Um, yep, it's timed out. All right, let's see. All right, so it's it's working fine now. I don't know what happened here. 
I'm going to not save that one. All right, so let's go back to thinking about aggregating the result sets and then uniting them. So let me select here, um, order date. Um, orders, and I want to group by one. All right, let me do the same thing to my, and before I do that, I'm going to make sure that this one works. Let me make sure that this one works because last time this one was tripping us up. All right, this one's working. So now let me union them all. All right. So here I have the result set from my first data frame stacked on top of my result set from the second data frame. Any questions here? Always. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we'll start with. Uh, we have two questions that are fairly similar, so we'll start with one and see if we need to ask the other. Um, but can you achieve a union also by just using joins? Um, I guess you could. Um, and I I think most of the time that's that's achieved through like a, an outer join. But for me, really, when we think about so you know as you guys are developing your SQL skills and your data wrangling skills, there are processing costs to that. And then um, there's also kind of like best practices. So if you're, again, looking to really just kind of stack two result sets on top of each other, uh, union is the way to go. But yes, you can achieve it through an outer join. Um, and then uh, a similar question is, how is a union and a full join different? They're not, a, unless you, I mean, they are not really. So again, you can use them interchangeably, but I think that um, there are times where you're going to get some of those null uh, rows or columns with null fields if you're doing that outer join. But yeah, you, you can use them interchangeably. Uh, and can you explain uh, a little about avoiding duplicates in joins? In joins? Mm -hmm. Okay, so... And this happened to me a lot. So think about, um, let me bring up an example with products, maybe. I think that might be a good example. So you may have a product ID for, you know, your company may, may produce like 10 product IDs. Um, and those product IDs are similar across your country, but they they are different in the way that um, every country has like some nuance to it, right? So like you're producing, let's say, um, a water bottle and the the same product key, let's say product one, two, three for US and product one, two, three for Canada might indicate a water bottle, but a different type of water bottle. And so when you're looking to join to the order, you might not be aware that if you don't join to both the product ID and to your country code, because that's also an identifier there, you're going to be duplicating records. And so um, you could be, and by duplicating records, what I mean is that if you're not choosing those unique keys or groupings of primary keys across tables, you could be uh, like duplicating rows because that same key shows up twice or three times in your um, in your data table. So think about water bottle one, two, three. Uh, when I join that to my products table, I have two rows of product one, two, three, one for each country, one for Canada and one for US, right? So when I join it to an order, and I'm only joining it to my product key, that one order is now going to have two rows. 
And so I'm going to duplicate the sales for that, the quantity for that, and the profit for that, because I failed to recognize that uh, there was a nuance in the unique identifier or the, the primary key, that there were two. It was the combination of product key and country that were really identifying the, the unique row of data. Does that make sense? I think so. <laughs> but you're also talking to someone who has no experience. I don't know if they can do like a thumbs up or something. Uh, yeah. I'd love to see the thumbs up in there. Um, uh, so there is a follow-up question. Uh, so does that mean you have to include all of the unique identifiers when joining? Um, all, yes, all of the relevant unique identifiers across the tables, yes. Um, and But sometimes, sometimes, uh, your, uh, your product ID or like your, there are some tables, some, some to be used, uh, go to the extent of creating like unique keys that already can handle for that, right? So like, let's say the, your, the combination of product ID and country are the fields that you're, you need to join on. There could be a column called like, I don't know, like SKU for instance, uh, that's that's the combination of both. And that SKU is unique. So if you just used SKU, you would use, if you'd have SKU, you would use it across the data sets. So, so yes, you should use, you should join on multiple keys if they are applicable to your data set. Sometimes you may be able to just use a unique key because that's been taken care of. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, we, we will answer a couple of other questions before, again, moving on. Uh, before we start answering more questions, we did release the certificate of attendance form. So uh, just be on the lookout for that in the chat. Um, uh, and Selma, we, we, we've had a couple of people that want to confirm. Um, so you're using uh, dBeaver with AD, AWS Redshift. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. All right. So that is confirmed. <laughs> um, um, uh, okay. Um, Do you want me to go back so, to my slides or? <laughs> no, I've, I'm just trying to get caught up with my questions because I've been dismissing them and now they're all changing the order. Um, so what does the C dot region represent? C dot region. Oh, okay. So that was an earlier snippet that I did. Okay, let me do that. All right, so I am aliasing my customer's table with the alias C. Okay. And so when I refer to region, I can prefix it with the table alias so that the query explicitly knows pick region from the customer's table. Mm -hmm. uh, can I, can I not to go in a rabbit hole, but I do want to show you guys this. Um, and then uh, see dot region from customers. Right. So if I didn't specify customer ID here, it's going to say that customer ID is ambiguous. And that's because customer ID, I'm sorry, let me fix this here for you guys. That's because customer ID appears both in the customer's table and the orders table. And so I need to explicitly tell uh, the query where to get the customer ID column from. This is likely going to happen to you. <laughs> If you are joining tables um, that have fields in common, like dates and things like that, where you're going to have to be explicit with kind of where, where you're picking the column from. So I'm going to pick customer ID from my orders column. So I'm going to say pick uh, customer ID from orders because I'm prefixing it with the table alias and then give me region from C, which is customers. Now, if I, I call this like cust, then I'd have to update this. And if I didn't update it, it would tell me, well, I don't know what C is. C is undefined. C relation C does not exist. Because I aliased it as cast. Right? Okay. Um, 
Uh, next uh, two questions, we'll ask them at the same time before uh, we move on. Uh, why is there a null in the union answer? So going back to uh, what was up there before. And then um, uh, how can we eliminate the null rows in such scenarios? If this person has been paying attention. And if you really want to know why there was a null, um, my answer should be that uh, I did this on purpose so that we can work on this in our next exercise, but it really wasn't on purpose. It was um, it was my fault. It was erroneous records as I was preparing the tables, but I kept it in there on purpose because if I go back to our next exercise, uh, filter. So how do we filter data? Um, you can do this using the, the where statement and what the where statement does is it allows you to specify conditions that must be met by your result set or your data frame. And you can use many operators. This is just kind of like a list of some of them. Um, the exercise here was like, how do, uh, can we identify the names of customers in just the East region? But um, before we do that, let's clean up the, um, the null, which is erroneous, right? So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say, um, so I already have everything kind of filter, I have everything kind of pulled, um, but within these result sets, I'm going to say um, where, so select from where. <laughs> Every time I say select from where, I think about the trifold that my colleague had given me. So um, we're going to do where the, the date part or extract year. And let me, give me a second. I want to make this visible to you guys. Um, is not null. So I'm going to pair this with uh, a couple of operators, right? So is not, and this doesn't have to be capitalized, is not, and then null, which is another operator. Um, and then I'm going to group by. I'm going to do the same thing in my second result set. Sorry, I'm just trying to kind of clean this up because I made everything so large now. And really, if you, as we were sampling it, we saw that we didn't have a null in the orders table. We really only had it from the archived orders. We could have applied this transformation to just archived orders, but it shouldn't hurt to do it in here. All right, so we've using where we filtered out the null records. Right. Um, and then, well, let me pause there because that was a new concept of filtering. Any questions there, Nathan? Um, let me check. Uh, not at the moment, I would say let's just continue and, and then I guess maybe uh, the rest of the questions we can save for the end. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, and so then the next um, concept that I want to talk about is creating new columns or enriching your data set, your result set. Um, and so with these columns, you can add criteria to your select cause to create a new field. So an interesting exercise given the data set that the data sets that we've been working on. Um, can we create a new feature called customer status? And the criteria for that is if the customer had more than one order, we're gonna label them as an existing customer. Otherwise, we're gonna label them as a new customer. If you are Excel savvy, you might be used to maybe like an if uh, function where you would say, you know, if the account is greater than one, existing otherwise uh, or else new. Um, if you've used other programming languages um, or calculated fields like in Tableau, you might be used to case statements. I'm going to stick to a case statement here, but the concept is the same. All right, so I'm going to come back here. All right, sorry, I wanted to pull up my code so that I don't have to Think and type. Um, so I'm going to select customer name. Uh -oh. Let me, for the sake of time, I'm just going to copy and paste this in here. 
All right, so I'm gonna select customer name, customer ID, order ID from customers, join it on orders, on the common keys that we've talked about. Now we know that um, we don't wanna see the order ID. What we do want is the count of order. So I'm gonna wrap this and count here, pause it here, time it out. <laughs> I'm gonna put a count. The more appropriate thing, if you would, if you're, let's say, like at a level below order ID, but you want to count distinct orders, is we would say count the distinct orders, right? Because our table is at the order level, we really the count and the count distinct are going to give us the same, um, the, the the same answer. Most of the time, I defer to a count distinct, so I don't want to put that out there. Um, and so just let me show you guys what this looks like. Um, and it's ambiguous because I see it's in both tables. We just talked about that. And I didn't group by, I thought I copied and pasted this group by one and two because count is an aggregation. So this should give me my results. Are, okay, perfect. All right. So, but remember, I don't really want to see their order count. I want to call them a new customer if they don't have uh, any orders uh, or if they only have one order. But if they have more than one order, I'm going to call them existing customers. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, wrap this in, in a kind of case statement. And so I'm going to say um, case when this count is greater than one, then call them existing. And because I'm just using like two conditions, otherwise call them new. So I don't have to rewrite that. Um, and I'm gonna close it out with an end. And this is gonna give me labels on these order counts. You. It might help if you guys kind of wrap this in parentheses just to kind of like keep the uh, the function within itself. And let's see. All right. So everybody that had uh, more than one order is existing. Otherwise they are uh, new customers. Any questions here? Um, I'm not seeing any explicitly for the section, but, um, uh, I, I think we should continue to the end because we are at the 60 minute oh. mark. Oh, so, so we're pretty so much we done. are at the end. <laughs> Thank you. Your, uh, resources will are, have already been linked, but they are in the slide deck as well. And then make sure to connect with me because I'm so excited about kind of tuning in with you guys and, uh, going along this journey with y'all. Okay, thank you so much, Selma. We do have extra questions, so if you don't mind sticking around for an extra um, uh, maybe 10 minutes, we'll try to get through as many as we can. Sure. Um, uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, all right, let's get to the bottom. Uh, will you share the recording of this webinar? Yes. Um, uh, Fatima, if you could share uh, maybe the link to where the recording will be. Um, uh, you can have that as well. Um, uh, can dBeaver allow you to drill into records that make up a row in the results set? Can dBeaver, sorry, I was reading the Q&A. Okay. <laughs> I'm scrolled all the way to the bottom, if, uh, if that helps you. Um, I'll repeat the question, please. Yeah. Can dBeaver allow you to drill into the records that make up a row in the results set? Um, yeah, you could do that with like a an index or like a um, if you were to explicitly name each row with an index, you could do that. Okay. You could also do that. By the way, just like when we think about drilling into a result set, you would do you would do that with a where clause, and you don't need to think about like the the position of the row inside of the data set. You could think about like the conditions that make that row up. So if it was a specific order ID, a specific customer, right? To like really drill into the data set, you would do that with the where clause. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, uh, before I say this question, if somebody in the chat has a response to this as well, would love to hear your answers. 
but this person says, hello, sorry, I work with geospatial data and I have heard SQL is almost necessary for geographic information systems field. Do you consider this true or, or have, um, have you heard about it? Thanks. So I'm, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer that question, but if somebody in the chat can, that'd be great. Is almost necessary for geographic information system field. I'm not sure what they're asking there. Um, I have, so like in a past life, I worked in the uh, public consulting sector and we used geospatial data, but we would use like GIS and they would not be in relational databases. So we couldn't query it with SQL. Um, but then there's also the flip side of like with customers where we had region and uh, customer addresses and different ge uh, geographic fields that we could query. So yeah, so SQL, Paul said SQL is for relational data. Geo has relational data perhaps. So like if it has coordinates, if it has um, uh, like if the tables have coordinates or, or uh, geographical information, Certainly you can query it. You can build out a data set with that geographical information. And then if you are leveraging some BI tool or um, or any kind of package like within Python or anything like that, you can definitely map it, yes. Okay. Um, how to do, uh, this is from Paul. So how to do a default for case win statement? Like if none matches, use certain value. You would just do that with the else statement, right? Paul, aren't you like the 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 SQL expert? Are you testing me? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I would just use that else statement, right? Where I would uh, I would specify my conditions. Um, so like we had if when the customer order when the customer count was greater than one, we would call them existing customers. If they were, you know, equal to one, we would call them new customers. Otherwise we would call them like, I don't know, random customers, right? So like the else statement and your case statement or, or the else clause in your case statement is how you would do that. Okay. Um, uh, let's go through We answered this one. Um, oof, so many questions. Uh, uh, can you explain aliases again? There were uh, quite a few uh, questions at the start about this and uh, I skipped them because we, we needed to go further, but uh, can you just go through the concept of aliases one more time? Yes, so... Think about aliases as you just renaming your columns or you're renaming the way that you're referring to those tables. That's really all we're doing. Um, let me see if I have something over here. All right, so if I did an alias, well, first the problem, if I did an alias customer name, which I didn't, or I didn't, I didn't alias my order, my tables, uh, I would get an error if we remember right. Uh, oh, let's see, I have a C somewhere. Um, because the customer ID is is present in, in both tables. So it's ambiguous. So that's the first kind of reason why aliasing is important is it allows you to refer to the um, the table. Well, actually it's not... In this case, it, we don't have to alias it, but um, it allows you to kind of create these like shortcuts, right? For for ref referencing your tables. I could say customers dot customer name, but if I alias it to C, it's much easier to refer to. The second part of it is, let me just quickly do this, just so I can give you guys another glimpse of where aliasing is especially important. Again, aliasing is really just renaming uh, the, the fields that you're pulling. Let me call this L, and I'm gonna say L here, all right. So let me run this for you. All right, look at this third column. It just says case. Um, if I were to connect to this in like Tableau and Power BI, or if I were to provide this to my team, they wouldn't they wouldn't get a sense of what this last column really is, right? Um, so if you're in Excel, what you would do 
do is you would just rename that uh, column header and you would call it as like, you would rename it something like customer status. And so that's what I'm doing here by aliasing it right after I, I specify the function. Again, you can use the keyword as. I'm gonna give this column name uh, something meaningful. Um, uh, so Selma, I think, um, I think we can end there. We're, we've already gone quite a few minutes over time. Thank you. Um, you know, this wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to do this without you. So big thank you and really appreciate taking a little more than an hour out of your day to do this.